Good afternoon and welcome to Sonosim's webinar focusing on overcoming barriers to resuscitative TEE training for clinical care hosted by Dr. Eric Savitsky. All attendees will be in listen-only mode and may ask our host questions during and after the session in real time through the webinar chat. A recorded version of this webinar will be available after our session. If you're just joining us, welcome. At this point, I'll introduce Dr. Eric Savitsky, Professor of Emergency Medicine and Pediatric Emergency Medicine at the University of California, Los Angeles. As the founder and CEO of Sonosim, Dr. Savitsky is a pioneer in ultrasound education. Welcome, Dr. Savitsky. All right, hi folks. Really happy to be with everyone and uh, pleased to be talking to everyone about transesophageal echocardiography and, and more specifically, uh, Sonosim's latest application, which is a laptop-based solution that overcomes barriers to resuscitative TEE training. So a little bit about what we're gonna be talking about today. So resuscitative transesophageal echocardiography or TEE, it's a, uh, you know, it's a TE application that's been described and, and leaders in our point of care ultrasound community, uh, everyone from Michael Glavius to some of the critical care community and Robert Arnfeld, as well as our emergency medicine point of care community that's uh, really focused on resuscitative TE, people like Felipe, Felipe Turan. All of these authors and leaders in the ultrasound community have published studies, uh, some of them uh, from Mike Glavius uh, extending over 10 years prior to today, and there's just been a lag and, and a failure really to broadly adopt a potentially very useful technology. So what we're gonna talk about today over 20 to 25 minutes is a little bit of resuscitative TE, its role in uh, the resuscitation of patients in cardiac arrest for a ROS patients, patients who have uh, in the immediate aftermath of a cardiac arrest, and talk a little bit about um, its role, but then also really examine why has there been this lag failure to adopt it more broadly, and then how has Sonosim's recent release of the resuscitative TEE uh, product that we're going to be discussing today, how can it potentially really help uh, broaden and accelerate the integration of resuscitative TEE into clinical environments as well as training environments? So a little bit about uh, how does resuscitative TEE, transesophageal um, echocardiography, compare to what is broadly practiced, which is resuscitative TTE, which is transthoracic echocardiography. So uh, many point of care practitioners, as well as uh, sonography programs, as well as simulation centers, are very familiar with teaching uh, TTE, transthoracic echocardiography. And the role that that plays in cardiac arrest, we all know, right? It can help identify reversible causes of cardiac arrest. It can help identify pseudo-PEA, where you don't think the patient has a pulse, but when you actually look at cardiac activity, you see reasonable enough of contractile function of the left ventricle that if you uh, work a little harder or establish an art line, that patient actually potentially does have a palpable pulse. And then obviously, whenever you're trying to do a procedure, or a central line access, peripheral line access, or confirming endotracheal tube placement, uh, transthoracic echocardiography um, or lung sonography or um, looking at diaphragmatic movement as you bag valve mass ventilate someone, all of those things um, can become critically important um, contributions. However, um, anyone who's tried to do transthoracic echocardiography during CPR with hands on the chest or a Lucas device or some type of mechanical compression device, it becomes very difficult to get the windows that you need when you need them and you're stuck trying to do them in between pulse checks. The advantages of resuscitative TE, putting a probe into the esophagus, is you can get better cardiac visualization. So any reversible cause is better and easily and potentially more effectively identified uh, because the transducer is that much closer to the heart and you don't have the impediments of having to work uh, during pulse checks only. You can have continuous uh, monitoring. Um, the other is, and we'll, we'll talk about it, it has the potential to actually optimize um, hand positioning during CPR, and we'll get into that um, in more detail in subsequent slides. So there's some very discrete advantages to transesophageal over transthoracic echocardiography, rather. Okay, so what we're talking about here is the concept of optimizing hand positioning during CPR. 
And this clip here, which I am going to uh, play, I want everyone to really uh, pay attention to what's happening here. This is a patient in cardiac arrest. This is a CPR operator, and this is a clinician. The clinician is going to be looking at the TEE transducer. It's placed in a mid-esophageal position in a long axis view. And what I want everyone to really observe is this is the left ventricular outflow tract. This is the left ventricle. The hands of the CPR operator should be in the lower half of the sternum, which is the recommended position uh, for CPR by the American Heart Association. However, due to variability either in hand positioning or even if the hands are positioned in the correct place of underlying anatomy, um, in 50 to 100% of patients in certain studies, when you do chest compressions with your hands um, over the lower half of the sternum, the left ventricular outflow tract um, in many cases is obstructed. So if you watch what's happening here, as the CPR operator pushes and does chest compressions, the outflow tract is obstructed, essentially um, counteracting any benefits of uh, or mitigating any benefits of left ventricular compression. And it's only when the clinician asks the CPR operator to move their hands a little bit more inferiorly do you get good compression of the left ventricle with an open LVOT, which we'll watch play out in real time. So as this clip plays out, you see a uh, convert compression of the LVOT. The operator moves their hands in fairly as the clinician optimizes hand positioning. And now you see not only the left ventricle being compressed, but blood coming out of the LVOT and to the aorta. So here's a really good vivid example of optimizing hand positioning as a benefit of uh, transesophageal echocardiography guidance. All right. So ASAP, uh, they've, in 2017, already established uh, what they feel are guidelines for what can TEE, specifically resuscitative TEE, bring as a benefit. So identification of the presence or absence of cardiac activity, so that plays into identification of pseudo-PEA at times. Um, many times you can identify the cardiac rhythm. You can see fine fibrillation, which can be sometimes difficult to appreciate on a cardiac monitor. You can evaluate left ventricular function, right ventricular function. You can identify um, cardiac tamponade physiology. And then there's a, a, some additional benefits that have been published that weren't necessarily part of the guidelines. Everything from identifying a proximal aortic dissection, identifying a both intracardiac thrombi and actually being able to see pulmonary thrombi when they're in the central circulation in the main PA or potentially right or left PA. And then uh, for patients undergoing ECMO, you can additionally follow the ECMO catheter to make sure that it's optimally positioned um, in the um, aorta. All right, so what we're going to really focus on is showing some practical examples here of how uh, resuscitative TE can have an impact. So this is a 55-year-old male patient in cardiac arrest. Chest compressions were uh, being performed by EMS. Patient was intubated on arrival. Um, and this is what you see during um, a pulse check really quickly. So you can see that there is really no um, sufficient cardiac activity. This is a transgastric view. So you're essentially looking um, here at the left ventricle and here you're looking at the right ventricle and you're seeing essentially um, no significant movements. Um, but what you're seeing is you're seeing some quivering here, some, some fibrillation, some fine fibrillatory um, activity. And this is ventricular fibrillation. So this is what it actually looks like when um, it's happening. So the patient undergoes um, defibrillation um, during this pulse check uh, where VFib, uh, fine VFib was noted. Um, and then immediately following the defibril defibrillation episode, the patient undergoes um, CPR. And you can see here that there's good CPR where there's opening of the left ventricular outflow tract. The hand positioning is optimized. Initially during this episode, the hand positioning wasn't optimized and there was closure of the LVOT here. The patient is undergoing optimal CPR hand position is optimized, the LVOT is optimized, so you're getting blood flow to the systemic circulation. And uh, subsequent to the defibrillation, um, ongoing CPR, a subsequent uh, pulse check did show that the patient was able to uh, regain um, cardiac activity and actually had a successful um, resuscitation. So it's just an example of uh, a transgastric view, how you can actually visualize um, a cardiac dysrhythmia. Uh, during the pulse check and how you can optimize uh, hand positioning uh, subsequent to that um, visualization, defibrillation, 
and kind of having that optimized CTR that led to a, a positive outcome in a successful resuscitation with no neurological deficits in this patient. Here's another uh, case study. So this is a patient, 35-year-old female, suffered a cardiac arrest. Paramedics actually responded, uh, started CPR, and started to uh, bag valve mass ventilate the patient, transferred the patient to the emergency department. On arrival to the emergency department, the patient apparently did have a return of spontaneous circulation. But then shortly thereafter, um, a subcostal view was performed to better look at the heart and cardiac activity. And uh, immediately there was uh, no evidence of cardiac activity. So as you see here, left ventricle, a dilated right ventricle was seen with no contractility. Uh, CPR was started um, immediately uh, subsequent to this. Um, and the patient um, underwent a subsequent endotracheal intubation. So here, uh, by performing the subcostal um, transthoracic examination upon moving the patient over, the patient who potentially was, um, was a ROSC, um, there was immediate appreciation that the patient's um, cardiac activity had diminished. There was evidence of right heart overload, so the patient underwent intubation. CPR was initiated. Cardioactive drugs were administered. Subsequent to the intubation, the patient underwent transesophageal echocardiography. So there, the transesophageal transducer was placed in a mid-esophageal position. This is a little bit of an atypical view, um, not a classic uh, view that is, um, has been described in uh, point-of-care ultrasound, but a very, very helpful one. So if you look at this clip, you can see the uh, right atrium, the right ventricle, and a big thrombus here. Um, in transit. So this is a thrombus going from the right atrium about to go into the right ventricle and presumptively there was a larger thrombus or clot board burden in the right ventricle that went into the pulmonary circulation that caused a big pulmonary embolism. So this patient, uh, the initial transthoracic echocardiography helped identify uh, loss of pulses um, very, very quickly. Um, in the resuscitation suite, patient underwent intubation, CPR, and then the TEE actually helped identify the underlying presumptive cause. So in combination with a big dilated RV and actually seen thrombus in transit from the right atrium to the right ventricle, a presumptive diagnosis of a massive pulmonary embolism was made. Patient received T, uh, TPA, um, a continued uh, CPR and resuscitation was performed and the patient did have a subsequent return of spontaneous circulation, had a confirmed uh, pulmonary embolism and actually had a, a, a miraculously positive recovery, uh, regaining vital signs after some time in the ICU and actually um, uh, was able to uh, recover with no neurological deficits. So a really nice combination of both transthoracic and transitioning to TE in terms of really guiding this patient's resuscitation. All right, so next case. So this is a case of a 47-year-old male um, presents in cardiac arrest. The patient actually had a history of a PEDDT in the past. Um, CPR was being uh, performed in route, um, and the patient, um, as you heard that story, you were preparing a TPA, so a, a thrombolytic uh, clot buster, because the person has a history of a PEDDT, has a cardiac arrest, so presumptively at 47 years, assuming he's had another uh, recurrence. So you're preparing to push um, a clot buster. Uh, patient undergoes intubation, and after the endotracheal intubation, a TE is positioned. This is what uh, a, a mid-esophageal position TEA, this is a long axis, a TE rather, this is a long axis view. And um, what you're looking at here um, in the long axis view is the um, left ventricular outflow tract. This is the aortic valve here. Um, this is the left ventricle, and this is blood coming out of the left ventricle into the aorta. And what you should see is a normal size aorta um, and an aortic root. Here you see a dilated um, aortic root. Um, these are centimeter markers, so you see you're at five, six, and then all of a sudden you have all these hyperechoic signals here that don't really belong, which is essentially the um, the, the flap, the intimal flap of the aorta, which is peeled off, and um, this is highly abnormal and consistent with a proximal um, aortic dissection. So immediately upon uh, intubating the person, uh, doing um, transesophageal echocardiography, um, obtaining a long axis view here, um, in identifying evidence of an aortic dissection, you don't give the TPA and the patient um, underwent um, a transition through the cardiac cardiothoracic surgery service onto a bypass um, machine, um, had a really complicated course, survived, and had his 
proximal um, aortic dissection surgically fixed. So the role that TE played here was identifying a patient that he would have harmed greatly by giving TPA based on the clinical history of cardiac arrest with a prior history of DVT. So what we went to immediately were showing three cases of how resuscitative TE potentially um, helped save a life or helped drive a resuscitation. So taking a step back, so um, what is resuscitative TE? So resuscitative TE is the use of transesophageal echocardiography in a very focused way. So um, rather than uh, using four positions for 28 views, which is what a cardiologist would, would do um, that essentially does um, TEEs, we're going to use three positions and potentially obtain you know, anywhere from uh, four to seven views. And the views that we're going to be looking at is a mid-esophageal position where you can see a, a four-chamber view here where you see the left ventricle, right ventricle, left atria, right atria. And this is almost a, a vertical inverted uh, view of an apical four-chamber that you can get with transthoracic um, echocardiography. So if you are good at TTE, you can use those same principles um, to really help you identify um, TE images. So this is a four-chamber view from the metasophageal position. This is the long axis view that's used to optimize hand positioning, as well as looking at the LVOT. Um, and this is um, obtained, once again, from a metasophageal position in the same esophageal position. Here you advance the transducer from a metasophageal position to a transgastric position. And here you can see a really nice view of the left ventricle and the right ventricle would be seen over here. So this is a transgastric uh, position as you advance the transducer. Um, the fourth position is advancing to a deep gastric position. We're not really going to use that in point of care necessarily. And um, the final thing that you can do is you can take the uh, transducer and literally turn it. Um, and you can turn it to the um, patient's left. And as you turn it to the patient's left, you can see the descending aorta and um, follow the descending aorta to the mid-thoracic ascending aorta. Um, position so you can actually really screen the aorta for dissections or intimal flaps or aortic pathology. So this is, once again, the three positions are an upper esophageal position, a mid-esophageal position, and a transgastric. And once again, if you turn the transducer to the anatomic left of the patient, it allows you to also, as you withdraw or advance the transducer, to really inspect the, um, the aorta. So this is what resuscitative TE is from a uh, technical perspective, using three positions to see anywhere from four to seven views, which is a more focused um, use of TE as, a com as compared to if you're doing a comprehensive TE exam, which potentially uses four positions to get 28 views, as described by the American Society of Echocardiography or the Society for Cardiovascular um, Anesthesiology. All right. In terms of who's a candidate for TE as well as potentially resuscitative TE. So TE has a whole host of um, absolute and relative contraindications. So, you know, a patient with a history of perforated viscous, the esophageal strictures, um, esophageal tumors, um, someone who has a history of a perforation or laceration or an esophageal diverticulum or an active upper GI bleed. So these are all absolute contraindications and then there's a whole host of relative contraindications that are relatively straightforward. With resuscitative TE, you know, in, in some ways, uh, things are a little bit different because your patients are already in cardiac arrest, and many of them are not going to be able to really give you that history. And, um, and a lot of the other um, uh, contraindications you're just not going to be aware of, and the patient's already, you know, potentially uh, dead and, and without heroic measures is not going to be salvageable. So a lot of these go away because you're not really aware of them, obviously, or if you're aware of them. Um, you know, the, the, the absolute contraindications uh, will potentially still be relevant, both for resuscitative TE as in uh, traditional elective TE. All right, a little bit about the probe and the machine setting. So, you know, the transducer frequency is about, you know, three to seven megahertz. So, um, you know, a, a relatively low frequency transducer. Um, all of the things that you typically would do for controlling your image quality, everything from gain settings, TGC, optimizing imaging frequency, optimizing depth, color flow Doppler, and temporal resolution based on sector width um, and depth. All of those things that you do with TTE, you would do as well with TE. So the controls are, for the most part, the same. Uh, the big difference is actually um, is how you control the transducer, and we'll talk a little bit about that. On the transducer itself, there's... Um, uh, conventional transducers have several knobs, um, but usually the larger um, of the two knobs 
will control um, the anti-flexion, retroflexion, smaller of the two, uh, right flexing, left flexing, and then you can change the imaging uh, plane through a imaging plane controller, and then you advance and withdraw the transducer uh, manually as well as turning it to the right and left. But we'll talk about that in a little greater detail. And then the transducer itself, in terms of the imaging, transducer sits on the distal tip here. All right, um, so just so we understand and have the same vernacular and vocabulary, uh, advancing uh, the transducer potentially from an upper esophageal to a mid-esophageal to a lower, esoph lower esophageal or uh, transgastric or deep transgastric, that's advancing and withdrawing is manually um, removing the transducer. All right, you can turn the transducer to the right and you can turn it to the left. Turning to the right is clockwise, turning to the left is counterclockwise. So once again, this is manual rotation of the uh, transducer by the operator uh, by essentially turning the um, transducer with their hands. The controls here, these are what are con uh, controlled through the knobs that we were talking about. So usually the larger knob um, is controlling anti-flexion, so flexion um, upward or retroflexion, flexion kind of mo more posteriorly of the transducer tip. And then there's the ability to flex to the right or flex to the left. And these are actual movements of the T transducer that once again are controlled by the, uh, the, the control knobs on a TE transducer that's, and the control knobs are located on the handle like we discussed. Um, this probe control is really important for folks to understand. And this is uh, taking the imaging transducer angle. So the neutral position is zero degrees and um, on the handle, you can actually change the imaging angle to 90 degrees or potentially 180 degrees. So while it's set at neutral, this is what a door chamber view looks like. But when you rotate the imaging plane to 90 degrees, um, all of a sudden you're getting a two chamber of view. And then if you actually rotate it at 180 degrees, you're just going to flip the uh, image horizontally. So this is a really important control because the combination of um, anti-flexion, retroflexion, uh, right flex, left flex, advancing or withdrawing and changing the imaging uh, angle, the combination of all of those things are how you actually obtain the four to seven views in the three different positions. So this is um, understanding how the controls work. Um, in terms of uh, the TE transducer, uh, they require high-level disinfection, not necessarily sterilization, but high-level disinfection. So, you know, bacteria um, and viruses, for the most part, are going to be um, uh, no longer present after the uh, transducer undergoes high-level disinfection. And then prior to use, really looking at the transducer for any cracks or loss of integrity of the surface becomes um, really, really important just from a mechanical, electrical, as well as infection a risk perspective. Otherwise, high-level disinfection, not necessarily sterilization, is what's in practice at a majority of facilities. In terms of preparing the patient, so this is very, very different, right? So patient preparation for TTE versus TEE. So a little bit here on resuscitative TE, um, that typically is being done with a patient model here um, as shown. So the patient model is undergoing CPR, and um, in that situation, many times, the patient's in a supine position. With elective transesophageal echocardiography, um, many times the patient's in the left lateral decubitus position, the patient has fasted. So very different. Um, many times with a resuscitative TE, your patient's undergoing uh, CPR, the patient's already intubated. So putting someone in a left lateral decubitus position and fasting, all of those things with elective TE are not necessarily um, relevant here. All right. So this is a uh, you know, really informative slide, and what we're looking at here are the three positions um, that are most commonly used for resuscitative TE. So an upper esophageal position, a mid-esophageal position, and a transgastric position. So the upper esophageal position is really good for looking at the aorta, um, right pulmonary artery, central pulmonary artery. So the view here that you can get is you can get a long axis view of the aorta and potentially also a short axis view. Um, and then you can advance the transducer to a mid-esophageal position, and this is a very, very high-yield position that gives you a four-chamber view, as well as the long-axis view, which is used um, to um, help optimize the hand positioning uh, during CPR. And then you can advance the transducer tip to the um, transgastric area, and then really get a good cross-sectional view 
of the um, left ventricle at the mid papillary or you know potentially mitral valve apical area and then you can flex uh, the transducer uh, a little bit towards the uh, right and get um, a good look at the right ventricle as well and then when you turn um, or rotate rather the uh, transducer posteriorly and to the left you can get a really good look at the aorta everywhere from kind of the distal to mid to the ascending aorta and really inspect it as you pull the transducer out. So this can be seen everywhere from a transgastric to a mid-esophageal to an upper esophageal position as well. So these are the views that you can get as you move the TE transducer through the different positions and manipulate it uh, through some of the mechanisms that we uh, previously described. Uh, once again, this is kind of an overarching slide that ties it all together. Um, these are the different positions that you can get uh, the views that we discussed and the probe controls. Uh, once again, this is the imaging uh, transducer angle that you typically would need to uh, manipulate the TE transducer controls to, to visualize anatomy. And you can see that you can see, uh, you know, essentially uh, almost every structure that is really relevant to uh, a patient's resuscitation um, that are, that's required uh, through a variety of, of these positions as well as views. Um, just to dig a little bit deeper, um, so we're just going to go through the three positions and the views uh, one more time. So first position is the upper esophageal position, and this shows how in an upper esophageal position, if you actually rotate your imaging angle to between 90 and 100 degrees, you're going to cut across um, the aorta here, as well as the right pulmonary artery. And here you're seeing um, the pulmonary artery, the right pulmonary artery as you transect across in the near field, because this is closer to the transducer. And in the far field, um, you're gonna get the um, ascending aorta uh, here um, in its long axis. So this is a nice opportunity to see the ascending aorta, see if there's any aneurysmal dilatation or any potential thrombus or any evidence of dissection. And once again, if you go from um, that 90 degrees and kind of rotate back to more of a neutral position, um, you, can, uh, you, you can visualize the this, these structures in a short axis as well. All right, here the uh, TE transducer is advanced uh, to a mid-esophageal position, so lower, and we start off basically at a 0 to 10 degree um, imaging angle, and you're getting kind of a high yield view here. So from a mid-esophageal position, what you get is the four-chamber view, the right ventricle, left ventricle, left atrium, right atrium. So really helpful uh, for a variety of different um, interventions. So this gives you a really good view of global um, uh, LV function, RV function, as well as if there's any significant pericardial effusion. So from the same position, if you rotated the imaging transducer angle to about 120 degrees, you're going to achieve um, right here about 120 deg degree rotation. And in this case, in this clip, it looks like it actually went to about 148. So um, as you change the imaging angle, you'll see a, a little corresponding icon on the actual screen, and that will indicate um, the imaging angle transducer. Here you can see the left ventricle, the left atrium blood comes in, then it is expelled during systole through the aortic valve out into the aorta. This is the RVOT. So once again, this is the view that really helps you um, get optimized visualization of um, chest compressions, as well as looking at LV function and, and the proximal aorta. So. If you take the transducer here, advance it into a um, kind of a transgastric position, and you're essentially at anywhere from an imaging angle of zero to maybe 20 degrees, you get a really good cross-sectional view here of the left ventricle. Um, what is apparent here is the transducer is here, so the closest surface to the left ventricle is actually the inferior um, aspect of the uh, left ventricle. So this is the inferior uh, segment of the left ventricle, and this is going to be your um, inferoceptal. And, and then as you flex and extend um, your uh, tip, you can peruse everything from the papillary muscle to the mitral valve um, to the base of the left ventricle and then back down towards the apex. And then once again, if you um, flex your transducer just a little bit to the, um, to the right, you'll be able to pull in the RV. So this is a really good way of screening the LV for um, overall segmental or regional wall motion abnormalities, evidence of our right ventricular um, overload as well. And then 
once again, so when you take your transducer and then you um, turn it to the patient's anatomical left, so you're turning it in a uh, counterclockwise position, then you can rotate the imaging angle. Here you're rotating it to between 90 and 100 degrees, and you get a really, really good view of the aorta. And then once again, as you withdraw the, the uh, transducer position from a transgastric to an upper esophageal position, uh, you can inspect the aorta for uh, pathologies such as atherosclerotic disease, dissections, aneurysmal dilatation. A really, really helpful view. And we talked about this a little bit earlier or alluded to it, um, complications. Many of the complications of TEE, as an emergency physician or critical care physician, you're very well trained to care for those. So airway issues, managing airway complications, um, you're pretty good at intubating and monitoring patients' um, oxygenation um, and respiratory drive and intervening if there's issues related to that. And many times with resuscitative state of TE, you're not doing these electively. You're not doing these in awake um, patients. You're doing these in patients that are in cardiac arrest or have recently been resuscitated. They're usually chemically sedated and they're already intubated. So a lot of the complications of, you know, or pharyngeal trauma, um, or um, esophageal trauma, laryngeal trauma are mitigated because your patients are sedated and you can do things in a controlled setting. That said, um, it is really, really important to be aware of all the potential complications and how to manage them. And the implication here is um, you do need to be highly trained um, and you know, have a very, very solid foundation because um, performing resuscitative TE in a time-stressed uh, manner, um, you know, it, it, does, um, you know, does bring some challenges with it. So it's really important to be aware of the complications, but as an emergency or critical care provider, you're in a really good position to manage a lot of the respiratory um, complications, but then just being aware of, uh, you know, a lot of the mechanical trauma complications um, is really, really important um, as you do the procedure. In terms of, um, you know, implementing a uh, resuscitative TE program, there's been some, um, once again, great articles by uh, Robert Arnfeld as well as Philippe Turan um, that really go through all the things, and it, it requires, you know, a, an institutional commitment, uh, buy-in from multiple services. Um, you know, your TE operators are going to have to be credentialed uh, by whatever facility they're working um, under. There's professional society guidelines, whether you're using ASEP, guidelines or ASE or SCA. There's a variety of guidelines that exist um, for resuscitative uh, TE, which once again is very different from comprehensive TE. Um, and then the operators do need to understand the principles of conscious sedation, cardiorespiratory monitoring, uh, must be able to uh, be facile with airway management, and then really, as we discussed, be aware of what the chief TE complications are, which um, you know there's quite a few, um, but uh, you know with appropriate training and um, skillful management, those can be mitigated. Um, infection control standards, uh, like we talked about, um, high-level disinfection, and then really um, inspecting the TE transducer for any mechanical breaks in the integrity of the transducer and the, um, the cable is really important. And then um, obviously, uh, once again, just making sure that um, you know, the biosafety operational standards of the device are constantly um, monitored. And what we're going to transition to right now is really focusing in and showing you the, the Soma simulator and what our resuscitative TE uh, training solution actually looks like. So we're going to take you through our actual tool that lets you um, really develop kind of that pre-training foundation that's required to perform resuscitative TE, which will require, you know, transitioning to uh, most likely a simulation center, uh, engaging in a full test uh, simulator, and then assuming there's a credentialing pathway and institutional buy-in working with a mentor um, with real patients in a, um, you know, uh, mentored environment um, as part of your institutional uh, credentialing pathway to being able to perform resuscitative TE. But what we're going to show you is how you really can use SOMASEM to develop that foundation so when you actually get into um, that simulation center and subsequent proctored environment, you've got a much, much more robust understanding of how the TE works, the image um, acquisition and image interpretation principles um, that, that really um, underpin uh, being able to perform these procedures. All right, so what we're transitioning to now is, so now we're within the, uh, the Soma simulator and we're gonna go through um, our advanced resuscitative TE course and we're gonna pick a case and load it. All right, so what you're seeing here, this is our um, 
resuscitative TEE uh, training program. So once again, this is a cognitive task training module that really will help you uh, pre-train for performing uh, resuscitative TEE. So really kind of give you an understanding of the principles. A little bit of um, how this is structured. So there's, um, there's four cases, and this is our Sonosum skill box. And this is purely intended to show you how um, TE controls work. So uh, right now you're in just uh, position B and in order to advance, remember in order to advance the transducer, um, this is advancing. So I'm just gonna advance from one position to another position. So the advancing is performed uh, by you know, manually advancing the transducer tip. Now, um, when you advance your transducer tip, this is your imaging angle. So this is an angle of zero and then this is a cone. The image here is what you would get um, as the transducer cuts through a cone horizontally. So this is the image that you would see. And this control here, the image plane rotation. So I'm gonna take, I'm gonna take the imaging angle and I'm gonna rotate it to 90 degrees. So you can see that this is the effect of rotating the 90 degrees. So once again, by going back towards zero, this is where we start. By rotating the imaging angle to 90 degrees, um, you're able to uh, get this corresponding image. And then once again, if I continue to rotate, I essentially get a mirror image where right and left are horizontally flipped. I'm gonna put this back to its um, original position. And then here on the controls, you're gonna see um, one side of this control or the other uh, light up as blue. So you can see if I'm advancing um, and moving the imaging angle um, forward from zero to 90. You can see the upper part of that control is blue. And if I go back the other way, the other side is blue. And these, these are the imaging controls on a lot of conventional TE transducers and how they work by pushing on one of these buttons, it will rotate the imaging plane. Now, a little on turning. So if I was gonna take this transducer and turn it to the left um, or turn it to the right, if I turn it to the right, this is turning um, the transducer to the patient's anatomical right. If I turn it to the patient's anatomical left, um, this is what you'll see. So you can see here, this is how the controls work. And this is manually performed um, by just turning the uh, transducer um, manually. Now, the other controls that you have are anti-flexion, um, which is taking the imaging angle and flexing it anteriorly or retroflexion and just taking it and flexing it um, in a retrograde manner. So this is the flexion and extension, the anti-flexion retroflexion controls. And if you can see here, they're controlled by this blue, larger uh, blue dial on a lot of conventional transducers. So the way it's rotated and the corresponding changes um, are represented in the simulator. Here, flexing to the patient's um, anatomical left or flexing to the patient's anatomical right. This is how the TE transducer works. And then we have a basic shape here in our skills box that really helps you understand um, how the uh, corresponding changes slice across an object that everyone um, can appreciate anatomically. Other really quick controls, you can change your depth settings, um, you can change your gain settings. Um, these are all very, very um, kind of standard controls. There's a caliper functionality that you can uh, do a variety of different measurements. So this is a little bit um, case one and case two, just simply go through and really teach you um, how to manipulate once again by advancing the transducer and learning how to use um, a lot of the controls um, that we talked about. Um, so you can have a really good understanding, just a good fundamental understanding of how um, TE controls work. Once someone has that pre-training and can appreciate how standard TE controls work, um, you will migrate into um, real patient cases. So here we have a 74 year old with a history of cardiomyopathy that actually comes in. So um, this is an opportunity to see a transducer inserted. And this is essentially what you would see um, when the transducer is inserted from an oropharyngeal to an upper esophageal position. So it's moved into an upper esophageal position. Here you're asked to examine the SVC, uh, the main pulmonary artery, the ascending aorta, both in short and long axes. So the transducer is advanced to an upper esophageal position. Currently it is in a zero 
So it doesn't match this. This is at 90. So this is at a zero um, angle imaging plane. Um, and from this imaging plane, you can see what is most likely um, here. You can see the aorta. So you're cutting across the aorta in short um, axis. And here you're seeing most likely the, um, the main and um, left pulmonary artery. This is most likely the SVC. So if I take the imaging angle and I rotate it, and I'm going to rotate it to about 90 degrees right here, all of a sudden now I can see, and what you're starting to see here is you're seeing the um, ascending aorta and long axis, so you can examine for any evidence of aneurysmal dilatation like we talked about or dissection. And, um, and here you can see that the probe's been advanced to about um, 25 centimeters. So now I'm going to go from an upper esophageal position, and I'm going to advance the transducer. So you advance by just moving the controls here. You can see the transducer um, advance um, deeper. Now we're into a mid-esophageal position, and we're asked to examine a lot of different structures here. So here we're already actually in a pretty good, um, kind of a pretty good four-chamber view, and you can do some optimization um, in terms of I'm just doing a little bit of rotation of the imaging angle, maybe about 10 degrees, but here I can see the left atrium, left ventricle, uh, right atrium, right ventricle, and um, if you didn't know how to um, really interpret this, you, there's a variety of controls here where you can take off layers, so you can really appreciate how the imaging angle um, changes. If you had, you know, wanted to put the patient in a different position um, to better understand um, your controls, you're able to do that. And then the probe guide. So if I said, please put the patient in a mid-esophageal position in terms of the TE transducer position and obtain a mid-esophageal long axis view, we have some probe guides here that actually, if you align to the uh, probe guides, and the imaging angle rotation should be somewhere around um, 120 degrees, you can actually use the probe guides and align to that you can see that you get a really nice um, view of the left atrium, left ventricle, aortic valve, LVOT. Um, you can apply color flow Doppler um, and uh, obtain a color flow Doppler clip. Here you can actually see that the patient, um, when you apply color flow Doppler, has got a little bit of trace aortic regurgitation uh, through this valve. But this is a, a, a nice example of um, how you can really learn to place the T probe in the appropriate position and uh, obtain the appropriate views. Here I tried to advance to a transgastric position and all of a sudden I get this alert. One of the critical things when you're performing TE is to never advance or withdraw the transducer when it's in a locked position. So it should always be unlocked so you don't cause mechanical trauma. And then when you have, um, you know, extreme or even moderate degrees of, of probe flexion, um, you technically want to uh, make sure the probes unlock and restore the uh, probe to a neutral position before you attempt to um, advance or withdraw. And these are just basic principles that help minimize any mechanical trauma. Here we've advanced to a transgastric position. And uh, like we talked about, in a transgastric position with a little bit um, of flexion, you can um, get a look at the left uh, or the right ventricle. And here we're looking at the left ventricle, relatively limited image quality. We're going to look at the findings video. Here you have um, this an expert This view is tutor. obtained from a transgastric position and is obtained at zero degrees. It demonstrates a short axis view through the left ventricle. So here demonstrate for, for every one of the views, you have an expert narrator. And you can see in the, in the actual echo clip, it was a relatively limited quality, either due to limited contact um, of the T transducer or gas or a combination of um, which was present in this patient. Here we're actually going to um, withdraw the transducer just a little bit and we're going to rotate it uh, posteriorly. So now the transducer has been turned to the um, anatomical left and we're looking at the base here. Um, it's the descending aorta, distal descending aorta, and now we're actually able to see the left hemithorax. And here what you can see within the aorta is an atheromatous plaque. Um, and uh, you know, at least a moderate um, size pleural effusion. Now I'm going to pull the transducer up a little further to the mid thoracic area. And when we look in the mid thoracic area, you can uh, the atheromatous plaque is diminished in size. You can see that uh, here's lung with some air bronchograms, but the pleural effusion persists. Here, if I take the transducer and I change the angle to 90 degrees, I can see that there's an atheromatous plaque still here. 
that I can see the aorta um, in long axis. I'm going to put it back to zero degrees, and I'm going to pull back to the proximal uh, thoracic aorta. And as I um, have the transducer tip uh, moved proximally, I see most of the pleural effusion is gone. So it, um, it looks like it's in a lower to mid thoracic region. And I can see the um, ascending aorta with no aneurysmal dilatation and just residual atherosclerotic debris. So this is just an example of, once again, uh, the Sona simulator. And what we've reviewed is, um, as a lead into this, you would go through a Sona sim course. There's um, an, a list of mastery test uh, questions. So we essentially assess how well you understand the didactic material. Then you move into the Sona simulator for image acquisition, image interpretation training, using, once again, real patient anatomy. And then there's a, uh, a module assignment that would task you with really going through and understanding how you actually um, control a TE transducer and how you would um, move the transducer to certain positions and obtain the optimal views. And then um, really importantly, just um, providing pre-training as a solid foundation and then a complement to subsequent training. So when you go to a simulation center and you're working with a full task simulator, when you arrive there, you already have kind of a rich underpinning and that time there is used in an incredibly efficient way where you can really um, you know, fine tune, go that last mile with the intricate hand-eye coordinated movements of the uh, TE controls. And then obviously, depending on the credentialing pathway of what facility uh, you work at, there would be some mentorship or some type of process that you would need to go through um, to achieve your credentialing thresholds um, that are gonna be very institutionally specific. So I just appreciate everyone's time here and I'm very, very excited once again to uh, provide our resuscitative TE solution, which will hopefully really provide a solid foundation and, and really help um, move the, um, you know, the emergency uh, medicine, critical care community, simulation community, as well as uh, the cardiac sonography training uh, community towards, you know, hopefully um, establishing resuscitative TE um, in more institutions which will be really tied to, um, in some ways, democratizing and really allowing more and more people access to the pre-training um, that really is a, a very, very solid uh, foundation and stepping stone for subsequent training and then using resuscitative TE to hopefully improve patient outcomes. So thanks for the time uh, today. Take care, guys.